Father, today we thank you that you indeed are our victory. That because of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for us, we have life, we have hope in this world and beyond this world. We have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. And Lord, we praise you for that. Because today some of us come into this room celebrating and others are struggling in defeat. And we need to know that you indeed provide victory to us. So, Lord, we're going to open your word and we're going to ask that your spirit would move in this room and speak to us and change us, would teach us and lead us into truth, that we might leave here rejoicing because the victory is real in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to uh, take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians, it's way back in the back of the New Testament, uh, most of the way through the Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then uh, there are Bibles in the pews around you that look just like this one, and we encourage you to grab one of those and use it. And by the way, if you need a Bible, if uh, you'd like to read the Bible and you don't have one, then we want you to take one of these. And uh, we actually mean that when we say it, so... uh, Hey, we're continuing our series called Impact, where we've been studying the book of Colossians, talking about how God wants to impact our lives personally, and then how we can impact the world uh, as God impacts us, uses us to, to change the world around us. So uh, today we're talking a, a, about a subject that a lot, is near and dear to a lot of us. So let me just start by asking this. Is anyone here feeling any stress today? Oh, lots of hands go up, a lot of stress. You know, it's uh, not everyone, though. I know, we, we really shouldn't be stressed because we're in church, right? We're supposed to, like, you know, lay our burdens down, and yet we still bring our stress with us. And, and we shouldn't be stressed because it's summer in Havasu. <laughs> right? People come here to de-stress, and it's too hot to be stressed. You know, it's just kind of uh, just slow down, and, and I do it. But the reality is we all have stress in our lives, don't we? Uh, We live in a stressful world, a world filled with politics and wars and terrorism and all kinds of scary stuff. And there's the economy and our jobs and our finances and and what's that going to play like. And we got relationships with stress. We got marriages with stress and our kids and what are they doing and how are they going to grow up and what teacher are they going to get. We got our parents to deal with, our friends to deal with, all that. We've got our own personal health to worry about. I mean, some of us are stressed about that. You know, you've got doctor's appointments and results and labs you're waiting on. You've got a bad diagnosis and you don't know what's going to happen. Some of you are stressed uh, health related because you went to your closet this morning and you couldn't find anything to wear. Right? And you're just like, ah, stupid closet. Like it's the closet's fault that, uh, that anyway. So, and so we're stressed and, and stress kills us. Yeah, it really does. It's a contributing factor to heart attacks and strokes and ulcers and all kinds of maladies. It keeps us up at night. It drives us to eat and drink too much. It, it, you know, and sometimes stress just puts us in a bad mood, right? Anybody ever get in a bad mood just because you're stressed? Oh, thank you for that honesty. You guys are the most honest service. Usually everybody's just looking at the person next to them like, that's you. <laughs> yep. And when you're in a bad mood, what do you do? You stress your family some more. So... Uh, we live in a stressful world, and, and really, in the midst of the stressful world, what do we want? We want peace. I only heard some of you say it, and I don't want us to shout it out and get the wrong answer. It's just like in school, right? Somebody raises their hand. I, think, I know the answer for sure, but I'm not going to offer it. Yeah, what, we, what is it that we really want? We want peace. I mean, that's why, you know, people do crazy things to try to get peace. They think, oh, if I take this new job, which causes stress, but to make more money, then I'll, I'll be at peace. Or they think, oh, if we just, you know, upgrade our house or our car or our motorhome or whatever, our toys, we'll have more fun and we'll have more peace. Or, or they think, oh, if I can just go away to the beach and just sit on the beach and stare at the waves and, and let go of all this stuff behind me, then I'll, I'll, I'll be stress-free and I'll have peace, right? Yeah, the problem is you take your family with you when you go. Right? And you're traveling there. And you're like, ah, I'm going to get away vacation. The kids are fighting in the back. So you're like, shut up. We're going to have fun. <laughs> this is for us to relax. <laughs> so we want peace. And, and we want peace around us. But let's be honest. Uh, that outer peace is not going to happen because of sin. It's just not going to happen. I mean, we... It doesn't matter how much you visualize peace or you, you know, uh, promote peace treaties or sensitivity training. 
Uh, we live in a broken, stressful world, and, and there's not really going to be peace in it until the Prince of Peace returns to change it all and usher in his kingdom. And so outer peace is an illusion. You can get it in doses, small doses, appreciate it when you have it. But inner peace is another story. Because inner peace, we're talking about a quiet soul, a restful spirit, being able to relax and not be afraid not be stressed. That's real. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, as those who, who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead and have made a commitment to follow Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God wants you to have peace. He wants to give you peace. And, and not just like some day, some future peace, but he wants to give you peace now. Today and every day. Uh, that's what we're looking at today. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. We're just reading a short passage, and then we're going to uh, break it down really intensely. Uh, here's what it says. Paul's writing to the church. This is to the church, and he says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying let peace dominate your life. Let peace lead your life. Let it rule your life. Let it have authority in your life. And this is a recurring theme of Scripture. Over and over again, it's, it's said to us in different ways. For instance, uh, in Joshua chapter 1, God's talking to Joshua. He's kind of stressed because now he's in charge of the whole nation of Israel. Got to lead them into a new land. All this kind of stuff. He's taken over for a legend named Moses. Uh, and, uh, and he's freaked out. He's stressed. And God says to him, Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Or, or how about Jesus? Talking to his you know, followers, everybody's listening to him, to the crowds, he says in Matthew 6, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. <laughs> it's half the battle, isn't it? Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. I, you know, God cares and he's going to be with you, take care of you. And Jesus spoke to his disciples the uh, night before he was betrayed. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Or how about this? The last thing that, that John records Jesus saying uh, in his gospel before the, the garden and the arrest and the crucifixion is this. John 16, if you want to write that down. In fact, if you, if you struggle with peace, write that in your notes. Look it up later on. Memorize it. Jesus said, I, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. He says, look, I told you these things so that in me you can have peace. You can have it. You see, God provides peace to his followers, and we're his followers. And what do we want? Yeah, we want peace. So why don't we have peace? Why is it not working? We're all trying to go, serenity now! <laughs> Sorry for all the Seinfeld fans. Uh, but... Uh, we don't, why don't we have peace? We want it. God wants to give it to us, and we're still living stressed out lives. Uh, here's the answer. Did you notice in verse 15, second little word, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let, allow the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts. Invite the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts. This is a choice. This is a decision that every one of us who are followers of Christ can make to invite Christ's peace into our lives. And, and so we have to decide to have peace dominate our lives or we're going to decide to let fear and anxiety and worry and stress dominate our lives. So do we want peace? Do you want peace? Okay. Then let's talk about the practices of peace. The practices of peace. See, here's the thing. Peace is not like an on-off switch that you just flip. 
There are practices, disciplines, if you will, things that we do, choices that we make every single day that will either invite peace into our lives so that we can grow in our peace and let go of our stress and our fear and our worry, or there are choices that we'll make that will invite stress into our lives and, and, and chase peace away. And so I'm going to share with you four practices, four choices out of this passage that will promote peace in your life. In other words, the more you choose them, the more you will become a person of peace. The more the peace of Christ can rule in your life. So if this is something that you really want, then I encourage you to look at these practices. And and some of them you're already doing probably, and some of them you're not. and, and, And evaluate how you can move your life in the direction of peace. Because Christ wants to give us peace. So, first, practice of peace. Inhabit the word. Inhabit the word. Did you catch what he said? And I'm just going to read from verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ reside in your life. Dwell in you. Take up habitation in you. Let the word of Christ live with you. Live with you, in you, be there, present in your life uh, every single day. Why is this so important? I mean, we we talk about this uh, all the time, but why is this so important? Uh, Well, here's how it works. If you learn and obey the Word of God, okay, you you study the Bible, you read the Bible, you learn and obey the Word of God, you're going to know God better. You're going to understand how God thinks and and His values and the things that are important to Him. You're going to grasp those, and as you know God better... You're going to trust God more. And as you trust God more, you're going to have more peace. Because that's the way it works. That's is a progression that you, there's no shortcuts to. It, because it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. You've all got relationships. You know, and, and hopefully you've got some relationships that are really, really close, intimate relationships. With, with people that you trust, that you love, that you know are for you. And when they say, you know, words of counsel and, and wisdom into your life, you listen to them. You believe them because you love them and you know them. And then you've got relationships that are they're shallow, right? They're acquaintances. They're the friends you hang out with maybe, but you don't really share your deep, dark, you know, uh, heart's desires with them, and, and you don't go to them for counsel and wisdom. You go to them to go see a movie, right? And, and, and so you don't necessarily know them as well. You don't know all the details of their life. You're not wrapped up, and, and you understand the difference in those kind of relationships. Let's just be honest. A lot of us have a shallow surface acquaintance relationship with God. And God invites us to trust him, and the more we trust him, the more peace we'll have. But we really don't know what God thinks and wants, and so we ask those questions, and we, we're, we're not sure that we can really do what he says. And, and it comes down to this. God wants to have an intimate love relationship with you, and the only way you're going to get to know him on that level is to take this word and let it live in your heart. Uh, by the way, that's why we offer you Bibles. And we're serious about it. You know, if you're a guest and you're thinking, they really give away those Bibles? Because those are not like those cheap, crappy little paperback, you know, New Testaments. No, these are like, you know, real Bibles. And and you can have one. Yes, because here's the thing. If you're going to use it for decoration on your home, no. You can buy one from Amazon, all right? But if if you want to read it, we know it'll change your life. And so, yes, we want you to take it. Because we want the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. And, and, and that's why we're always promoting these things called life groups. Where you can connect with other believers. And, and you can study the word of God. And you can learn the word of God. And apply it to your lives. And, and other people can help you understand it. Because that's healthy. Because we want the word of Christ to dwell in you. You see, Jesus, if you go back to John 16, 33, Jesus said, I told you these things So that you can have peace. I told you these things. Here's the thing. If you don't know what these things are, are you going to have peace? No. If you don't know what Jesus is saying, then how are you going to have peace? Because you don't know it to believe it, to follow it, to live it. So that the peace of Christ can rule and dominate your life. So are you inhabiting the word? If you inhabit the word, you will grow in peace. Second practice of peace. Speak encouragement. Speak encouragement, not 
fear. Continuing on in verse 16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. Kind of a fitting that we're honoring teachers on a day when we're talking about teaching and admonishing one another with wisdom. Because every one of us in here wants our teachers to speak wisdom and truth and encouragement into the lives of our children. Because we want our kids to like school, don't we? Because if they like school, then they won't grow up to be idiots. Well, some of them will anyway, but uh, <laughs> it's less likely, okay? At least they'll be smart idiots and then get jobs and, you know, take care of us when we get old and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, honestly, we don't want society filled with a bunch of dumb people. So we want our teachers to do a great job. So that's why you pray for your teachers and you encourage your teachers and that kind of thing. And you want them to do that to our kids. But understand, all of us, our words are powerful, our words are powerful. They're powerful to bless or curse. They're for good or evil. And, and, and our words are powerful to others and to ourselves because our words reveal our heart and our attitude and our expectations. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you want to know what's in somebody's heart, all you have to do is listen to them for a little while. And, and you can figure it out. And Paul, Paul wants us to encourage each other by teaching wisdom and offering praises and worshiping God. So how does this translate into peace? How does speaking encouragement bring peace into my life? Uh, there's two ways, really. One's really simple, and that's this. The Bible says that we reap what we sow. We reap over and over again. It tells us that. You're going to reap what you sow. And so it's a principle we can't get away from. So if you're speaking blessings and hope and encouragement into other people's lives, guess what's going to come back to you? Yeah, blessings and hope and encouragement. And if you're speaking, you know, critical negativity and, and discouragement into people's lives, you're pretty much, you know, going to live there. So that's one way that peace comes back to you when you speak encouragement. The other way is this. There is a battle going on for our hearts and our minds. And it's a battle between fear and peace. And, and, and see, all of us have the voice of fear in our lives because we're sinners. You know, that's just one of the side effects of sin. Scripture says, perfect love casts out all fear. And, and because, you know, we're messed up and not perfect, we've got fear in our lives. Now, to counter that, we also have the voice of the Holy Spirit who is speaking peace into our lives. And Satan likes to crank up the volume of fear because he wants us to be afraid. And, and what you speak reveals what is in your heart. It reveals who you're listening to, which voice. So are you speaking God's thoughts and his ideas and his wisdom and his encouragement or are you speaking the world's anxieties and fear and despair? What are the words coming out of your mouth? Here, let's make it really simple. Let's go to the, your, your home, your family. When you are with your family, because that's when you're the most brutally yourself, right? You're honest. You go to your family. Are your words to your family, to your spouse, to your kids, to, to those that live in your household, are you promoting hope and encouragement to your family? Or are you predicting failure and doom and pain? Here's the difference. Here's what it looks like. Uh, we're empty nesters. We've sent both of our girls off to college. In part because we didn't have a four-year college here at the time. And in part because as they're growing up, going away is part of that, that process, that journey. And so as a, a father of daughters, you know, I, I wanted them to be safe. I, you know, you always have concerns for their safety when you're not there to protect them. Uh, not that we always can protect our kids even when we're there. But, but you have that, that concern. And so there's different ways of speaking into that. So the voice of, of hope says things like this. Hey, honey, uh, uh, you know, I want you to be ready. I want you to be aware. I want you to be cautious. The voice of fear says, baby, there are people out there trying to rob you and rape you and kill you all the time. Be afraid. <laughs> Just saying. What's your voice sound like to your kids? What's your voice sound like to your spouse? See, for years, every time I went on an international mission trip, without fail, this happened. People would come up to me and say, Pastor, 
we don't want you to go on this trip. We're afraid something bad's going to happen. You're going to get a disease. You're going to get killed. Some plane's going to crash. Whatever kind of fear they can speak into me. And I was like, thanks for your concern, but I don't worry about that because I know where I'm going when I die. And God can kill me in Africa the same way he can kill me in America. So it's good. And uh, that never satisfied them. One time I had a person come to me and actually say, Pastor, I had a dream and God told me you're not supposed to go. I said, thanks. I'm pretty sure God can tell me that personally. Because I sleep, and, uh, you know, and therefore, if God wants to talk to me in a dream, he can dream it in my head, and uh, I'm good with that. And, and so, you know, that's, those are, they, they were well-intentioned, well-meaning people who were speaking fear and failure and doom into my life. And, and uh, here's the thing. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? Because if you're looking for bad things... If you're looking for bad characteristics in everyone you meet, if you're always looking for the negative, you are going to find it. And you're living in fear. You're living in failure. You're living in discouragement. But if you're expecting tribulation, because Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation, but what you're looking for is how God is going to redeem it, how God is going to take the brokenness of our lives and put it back together in a beautiful way, how God is going to be there to heal and to give hope and to give life, then what you're going to do is you're going to be looking for God to redeem, and you're going to be able to celebrate his goodness and his provision and his power in your life every single day. And what you're looking for is revealed by what you're speaking into the lives of the people around you. So if you want peace, learn to speak encouragement. Now, uh, uh, some of you aren't sure. You're like, do I speak peace? And and some of you are like, I don't want to know. But if you're courageous enough and you really want to know how your words are impacting people around you, ask those that you trust to be brutally honest with you and tell you. And then ask God to help you learn to speak encouragement if that's not part of your life. And by the way, the more you grow in speaking encouragement, the more peace you're going to have. Third, practice of peace. Be thankful. Be thankful. I know you're expecting that, but I'm going to read this passage again. And I want you to count how many times God or Paul tells us to be thankful uh, in this passage. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do you think there is someone not thankful at the moment? (laughs) So we'll we'll just all pray that uh, she'll have peace in just a moment. So, um, you know, we, we want to we be thankful because thankfulness is part of this practice of peace. And we're not talking about being thankful because everything's going your way. We're talking about the discipline, the practice of giving thanks when you're stressed, when you're worried, when you're anxious, when you're afraid. In the midst of the crisis and the difficult times. Because this is key when you get stressed or worried to, to give thanks to God. To be thankful, to acknowledge God's goodness in your life, to identify specifically his blessings for you, the way that he's redeemed your life, both in the future and right now. And if you will do this, it will bring peace into your life. Why? Because giving thanks to God reminds us that God is with us. Giving thanks to God reminds us that God is for us and that God's plans are better for us than our plans are. And so when you're down and you're struggling and you're fearful and and you're worried about what's going to happen, it it looks like this. You go, God, you know, I'm really struggling, and so I'm just going to give you thanks that you're with me. I I don't even feel you right now, but I know you're here and I know you're with me, and so uh, thank you for being with me and thank you for loving me. I don't deserve your love. Man, you know all the stuff I've done, and yet you've forgiven me. Thank you for Jesus because he died on the cross to pay for my sins, and and so now I, I don't have to go to hell. So thank you for heaven because that's where my destination is going to be. And God, thank you for adopting me into your family as sons and daughters of God because uh, I don't deserve it, but, but you didn't just make me a servant. You made me a son, and, and I get to share in your inheritance. And thank you that, that you've given me the victory. And suddenly, instead of being trapped in this place of despair, you're going like, hey, I'm going to win it all. See, that's what the discipline of gratitude does in our lives. It may not happen that fast, 
but it will happen and you will grow in peace as you practice the discipline of giving thanks. Now, don't just tell me that you're thankful. Because every time I preach on gratitude, every time I talk about that, people go, you know, pastor, I'm thankful, but... You just don't know what I'm, yeah, I'm thankful, but you don't understand my wife, my husband. I'm thankful, but, and and here's the deal. If you say I'm thankful, but you're not thankful. You're not. Here's what I've noticed. Don't tell me that you give thanks. Give thanks. Practice gratitude to God. And and I'm not talking about publicly where everybody's around you watching you do it. Uh, I'm talking about in your private time with God. You pull away from everybody else and you just start going, God, I got to give you thanks. And if you can't do it verbally, do it on paper. Write it down. Make it a discipline. See the blessings that God has given you. It will change your attitude. And, And I have noticed this. Gratitude and grumpy can't coexist. And so it will change not only your stress level, but the stress level of the people around you because it will change who you, your attitude and how you present yourself to others. So if you want peace in your life, be thankful. The fourth practice of, of peace. Represent Jesus in every situation. I you love verse 17. What Paul says, he goes, whatever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, By the way, that doesn't just mean that you say the name of Jesus. What it means is that you live your life in a way that is representing the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to do it in his name. To pray in his name, it means that you're living in a way that represents what Jesus wants in your life. Everywhere you go, everything you do. Now, Catch this, one of the reasons that we don't have peace, one of the reasons that we have fear and anxiety in our lives is that we want to control outcomes in life. You and I have this natural desire to be in control. Ah, Any control freaks here? (laughs) They're like, I'm not raising my hand because I'm not in control of this moment. Yeah, we like to be in control. Every parent struggles with letting go of the control of their children's lives. And and so we want to be in control and we try to control the outcomes of actions, of people, of events and circumstances. And here's the thing, we have no control over outcomes. It is an illusion if you think you can control an outcome. You have control over your behavior. You have a control over your attitude. That's it. You, You choose your choices, nothing else. And what Paul is challenging us, he says, look, if you you want to grow in peace, then what you need to do is stop trying to control the outcomes and instead just control yourself so that you represent Jesus in every situation, whether good or bad, whether crisis or celebration, you are there presenting the person of Christ. Because if we focus on representing Christ, then he's going to show up. You see, we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And when we talk about making choices about your behavior, about your attitude, what we're talking about is character. Character, the character of Christ in our lives, day in and day out, everywhere we go. Because you can control that 100%. And when you show up and you do that character of Christ in life, it's powerful. It impacts you, it impacts other people, and it brings you peace. Because God is delighted in you because you are representing Jesus and you're trusting him with the outcomes. Let me say that again. God is delighted in you and you represent Jesus in your life day in and day out because you're trusting him with the outcomes. Try this in your family. Stop trying to control everybody and just try to represent Jesus and watch the change in your family. It's amazing how that'll happen. The same thing at work. And and so God is excited about growing your character, your attitude, your behaviors to match Jesus. That's why... God won't remove difficult people from your life. Sorry to disappoint you. God's not going to remove difficult people from your life because he wants us to love them. Right? Love one another as I have loved you, stuff like that. It's why God allows us to suffer at the hands of evil people so that we can demonstrate mercy and forgiveness to a world that needs it. It's why God does not always heal our bodies of sickness and disease and and restore our health perfectly. 
Because he wants us to shine our faith in him through the pain that is temporary because we know what is permanent. That's character. That's demonstrating faith. It's why God doesn't make all of us rich so that we can glorify him as servants who are content with what he's given us. Character. We want our outcomes and God wants our character to reflect Jesus. And if we trust God with the outcomes and we focus on representing Jesus at home, at work, at play, at the store, then we'll grow in peace and our lives will become powerful. You want impact? And we're talking about peace impacting your life, but you want impact? This will impact the lives of the world around you. Because as we grow in peace, we will impact our world as we're living as people of peace. And and, and you guys know this. You understand why. Because we live in a chicken little, the sky is falling world. Don't we? I mean, people are panicking. People are freaking out. People are worried about stuff in the Middle East, and they're worried about Russia, and they're worried about getting on a plane right now because they are falling out of the sky, and they're worried about the economy. They're worried about everything. And if you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, trust God enough, know God well enough to believe him and to trust him with the outcomes, and we represent Jesus in this world, then what happens is people see Christ in you, And they see the peace that you're living, and they go, I want that. You don't have to sell anything. They're like, I want it. Here's the way it works. If we will be a calm and hopeful presence reflecting Christ, it will draw people to Jesus. It will draw people to Jesus. That's a life of impact. And it can only happen if we're people of peace. But you got choices to make. Get practices to step into. What is God telling you today? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you desire to give us peace and you will give us peace if we will but listen to you. So Lord, right now I pray that your spirit would move in this room and you would speak hope and life and encouragement into our hearts that you would take away the fear And you would help every one of us to trust you more, to believe in you more, to follow you with our lives. Even as we remember your death and resurrection for us, God, give us that peace that passes understanding. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to continue worshiping God. The band's going to lead us in worship, and we're going to celebrate communion. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then uh, when the band plays, we're just going to invite you to slip out from where you're seated.